Eternal Duels is sponsored by Tales of Adventure and Moxfield. Build your decks on Moxfield. Get your cards at Tales of Adventure. Hey, I just want to give a quick shout out to all of our Patreon supporters out there. Thank you to the Dirtle Maniacs. If you want to be a Dirtle Maniac, go to patreon.com slash eternal dirtles and help support the channel. It keeps things going. It keeps things updated. Thanks so much for watching. On with the show. Hello and welcome to MagicCon Chicago. I'm your host, Zach Clark, and this is 30 years of magic comment and commentary uh, with guests Mark Rosewater and Seth, also known as Saffron Olive. Thank you all for coming. Um, so what, what we've got here is a, a deep dive into the history of magic media and discussion, uh, magic journalism. Uh, so I'm assuming most of you are, uh, are interested in into that sort of thing. Uh, because you're here, so thanks for coming. Um, so let's start off uh, by talking about our guests. So first we've got Mark Rosewater. I, I wanted to uh, make this actually my Christmas card one year, and my wife was like, absolutely not. That's not going to happen. Um, obviously we know, we know Mark. We all know Mark. Uh, legendary figure in the Magic community. Uh, he's the head game designer. Uh, head, head game designer? Is that the current head status? Head designer? Yeah. Um, you've... You know, you've made so many, you've made so many magic cards, so many magic sets, um, but you've also done a lot of the a lot of the groundwork for uh, magic journalism and and just magic content. Period. I believe I've written more words on magic than any human on the earth. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right now, they can come by the the words of my podcast. I currently produce a million years of, a million words a year of magic. Wow. Um, yeah, and then uh, also we have Saffron Olive, who, who many of you know from uh, MTG Goldfish. Um, you know, both, both these gentlemen are uh, very, very active in the Magic the Gathering community. Apparently I have pop-ups happening, I'm sorry. Uh, are, are very big in the Magic community. Uh, they do a lot of work with the Magic community, and uh, I'm, I'm super excited, as I'm sure you are, to have them here. So uh, again, thank you so much, guys, for, be for being on. Thanks for having um, so the first era of Magic the Gathering uh, media I want to talk about is the is the print era, and um, Mark, you had a lot a lot of hand in I, that. I did. This was yeah. uh, uh, so basically in January of 1994. So when Magic first came out, there was like no, there was nothing written about the game. Um, and uh, as an early Magic player, because I did start working at Wizards, I started freelancing in '94, working in '95 full time. Um, I was eager to read about Magic, and there was nothing. There's absolutely nothing. So in January of 1994, Duelist 1 comes out, uh, which I literally read, I think I was waiting for a date to show for some blind date, and I read the, the entire thing while I was waiting, I love really. Uh, I read the entire thing, uh, and then I contacted them because I felt like it was, it was very light on like it, was, it was very beginner-oriented, and I'm like, I wanted to see more advanced stuff. And that's when I pitched my puzzle comments, where I got my start, I guess. Um, so issue one and a half of the puzzle comments. Magic the Puzzling. Magic the Puzzling. Uh, and then you turned that into a book. I did. I turned that yeah. into a book. Uh, and then what eventually happened was I flew myself to Gen Con to meet with Catherine Gaines, who was the editor-in-chief at the time of The Duelist, and I said I wanted to write articles. And she's like, pitch me ideas. If they're good, you can write them. Uh, and I pitched her two articles, one about, um, I think that article was called an MTG or at Gen Con, which was a term they never put on. Um, <laughs> And I wrote about the very first World Championship, which I actually was, if you ever see pictures of the World Championship, I'm at the table taking notes because I, I wrote an article on it. Uh, and, I, and I transcribed the whole thing, so. Um, and anyway, I started writing articles for The Duelist. Uh, and through writing articles for The Duelist is how I started getting freelance work for Wizards. That would eventually lead to a job at Wizards. Um, but I wrote a lot of articles. In fact, my, there's one Duelist where I wrote 20% of The Duelist. Um, <laughs> And then, when Catherine Haynes left the company, um, we needed to find an editor-in-chief, and they couldn't find anybody, so they begged me to do it. And so, uh, for the rest of the time, or for most of the time, I was the editor-in-chief of The Duelist. So, I have much to say about The Duelist. Uh, anyway, I... See, magazines were once this thing, we would print on paper, and it would talk about... Uh, so, uh, anyway, Magic had it for a while. Uh, it died out around the time of Pokemon um, for a while. For, for a while, Duelist, it was, Duelist on one side and like a Pokemon magazine on the other side. Um, and then eventually just, we would transition into part two, which is the website, but um, yeah, so 
It was Duelist was there, and then we had, we had two other magazines, which he has up here. Yep, Scry um, and uh, Inquest. Inquest. Um, they would do things that we wizards wouldn't do at the time. Oh, that's a play, right? You can talk about that. I'm quite honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we, we, the idea of, for the duels was just, hey, we want to talk about things and talk about magic. And th at the time, so just so people understand, the internet, when magic came out in 1993, it existed. It was what they called the used net. Um, the World Wide Web as we know it was like in, at, like, in, in infancy. Like, I remember logging onto the Wizards website and there was no graphical interface on my computer, so I had to go, I had to go over three, then up to, like, I had to like learn the path so I could get to where I needed to go, because there was no picture to look at, so. Um, but that's like early magic, and a lot of early magic was in, like, you wrote on magazines and people would buy it in the store, and that's how people would read about magic. And a lot of writers that we're going to talk about today, including Mike Flores, got their stuff ready to do. Yeah. I mean, I tore those things up just reading cover to cover uh, in, in middle school and high school. Just any, any magic information I could get my hands on, uh, especially, you know, the, the print magazines and there were some books and stuff like that. Just anything you could do to get, to get your hands on magic content because it was so few and far between at the time. And one of the things that was important to me because I was the, the, as editor-in-chief was I really tried hard to get what I thought were really good writers about magic to write about like topics that I thought were more advanced so that people could learn about strategy and theory. Um, and I would, I learned a lot of who, like, who the top players were and I would, I would convince them to write you know, articles. And so a lot of the early, the really good early magic players, all were articles for the duelists because I would make them write articles and I paid them and some of them. Uh, yeah, so you know, we I think we've established this, but uh, the Prenera was the, set the groundwork, and uh, a lot of the a lot of the um, the patterns you see in current media for magic are still echoed through uh, through all the way f back from when we started, you know, just doing deck lists and stuff like that. All that stuff leads into today. It just all the groundwork was created uh, at the very beginning of the print era. In early magic, by the the first two years, we did not print deck lists. Because Richard's original vision was that people weren't supposed to know what the cards were, they would play their opponent and learn what the cards were. And so, luckily, I would record stuff like that. Like the, the reason we know that World Championship decks is I wrote it down, and years later I put it online, or put it in the list. But um, early on, we did tell people about what the decks were. Wow. Man. It was a different time. We also did put rare symbols on cards, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so of course the Duelists had deck text, event recaps, comics. The comics were interesting. You, you want to talk a little bit about the comics, the Phil and the Phil oh, Kaja? Oh, the comics. Yeah. Yeah, they were super fun. Um, it's called What's Next with Phil and Dixie, I think. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, and it, they, they, they read Phil Foley, which was hilarious, just write a, a comic every, every month or every other month. Um, and it, if you've never seen them, they're super fun. And he, he, would make a, he would make fun of magic in a way that probably most people wouldn't have if they were writing for the company that did it. But he, he loved it. It was mostly in fun, but he, he loved to both fun and magic. It was, it was a lot of fun. Another thing, so you said initially deck lists were kind of taboo. Another thing that was taboo in Duelist specifically was priceless. Uh, we eventually would get a priceless. You did, list, yeah, initially. Um, but with that took years. And Scry, as the magazine actually started, they were, and that's what Scry was early on, really, was a place to get a deck list, a uh, price list that wizards, we did not do. So we've got a couple of the articles here. Uh, I, I went through my own personal collection of Duelist magazines that I still had in my dad's uh, attic. And uh, I've got a couple, a couple of the articles here. Uh, one of them is a deck deconstruction by Henry Stern. Uh, and this particular installment, uh, I wouldn't know this at the time, but a very good friend of mine, Charles, uh, wrote into the deck construction. And I found this years later when I was flipping through. And I was like, Charles, did you write this to, to the deck construction? So here is the actual article. It is a, a blue-black deck called Who Needs Mind Twist? Uh, and this is right as Mind Twist got banned, I think, from, uh, from Standard. So uh, they're, he's just asking these two guys and to like create a so deck list. We're going to take real quick. Is we used to do this thing at, at uh, events called the Deck Limit, where a member of R&D, well, you could come and bring a deck, and we'd look at it and tell you how to make it better. And my number one tip was you want to have more creatures than Norris. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have another article here. Uh, this is this is one of yours, Insider, oh, insider Trading. trading yes. uh, this is, I believe, this is the first Insider Trading. Uh, not the first Insider Trading, but the first one where I did the teasers. Yes, that's well. That's a big part of it. Is the is the teasers, the Easter eggs, 
uh, and, and that sort of stuff that you would, it, that you would come up very with. First, the first season I ever did was for Mirage because I, I thought it would be so awesome to do the one minute of Volvo Trampoline. So I've got a little uh, uh, class participation here, uh, and, and I uh, broke these down uh, so that we could uh, just call, call out the first one if you can guess the first one. It's a 12-12 uh, artifact trampler with a casting cost of one. Anybody know? You got it. All right. How about that? All right. So next we have a zero cost artifact that provides three mana of any color. That is Lion's Eye Diamond. Uh, a red sorcery that provides an extra turn. Well done. All right, this one's tough. A green creature that can come into play as a 7-7 seven, seven with no upkeep for four mana. Well done. Well done. I did not think anyone was going to get that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I figured you would get it. <laughs> All right. So uh, from there... We have a Scry Magazine, which we discussed, uh, you know, this rode the CCG boom. So it wasn't just magic. They put in a lot of, like, Star Wars was a big game, which you needed a whole fire hall to play because it was a wide game. Uh, Overpower and uh, Legend of the Five Rings. There were several different other card Star games. Trek. Star Trek, yeah, yeah. of course. Um, so, yeah, there were all these other card games that they covered. And so you got a little bit of magic in here, but the big thing was the price list. Um, and uh, I have... Uh, a 1996 uh, Alpha Black Lotus being uh, $400, and that's about uh, $800 in today money. Uh, so if you can just think, like, back in the day, I tried to get my dad to buy me a Black Lotus for, it was $300 at the time, and um, yeah, he, did, he, didn't, he, he was like, no, I'm not spending $300 on a piece of cardboard. It's not happening. <laughs> then we go to Inquest magazine. Inquest was more, so they, they, these were the same guys that did Wizard and Toy Fair. And, um, and they, they, it was a more jokey kind, kind of thing, but they also had a lot of things like killer decks, and uh, they also considered Ice Age one of the worst cards ever printed. Or, sorry, Ice Age. Necropotence is one of the worst cards ever printed in Ice Age. And they also picked um, uh, Dream Halls as the worst card in Trouble. So there's the one star on Necropotence. Um, and then, uh, so I wanted to talk to you about this, this particular article. What went down at Wizards when this article came out? The Six Color of Magic. Yeah, we, we thought it was funny. I mean, ironically, whenever we talked about the Six Color, now it's always purple. Just because they sort of cemented that's what color it is. It's purple, so. Um, but when we, um, when we did uh, Planar Chaos, for a while we experimented with having Six Color, which was purple. Um, and it was always purple because it's ever purple. Yeah, this was a this was a big point of contention at my LGS growing up. Is like, when are they coming out with purple based on this article? And it was always like, whoo, uh, it was it was a hot topic. All right, so next we go into the Usenet post, uh, IRC and, and the Dojo dot com. So you you spoke a little bit on, on, on Usenet. Oh yeah, so um, I used to go into Usenet. Like, Tom Wiley uh, was the very first rules manager before he got hired by Wizard. We just go into Usenet and answer rules questions. And that's what got him hired as the very first rules manager. Uh, I, you, you actually go, you can go, you can find some of my old posts on Usenet. There, and this is before I was even, I didn't work for Wizards. I would just post things in Usenet because I was interested in talking about magic. There wasn't really any place to talk about magic back in the day. Like that's why you wanted to use this to talk about magic. So I, I pulled out of the Duelist uh, a, a article about the internet. Um, and uh, this was a quote from Richard Garfield uh, that I just had to include here. Uh, Everything happened faster because of the internet. Uh, well, Richard, like I said, Richard's vision was people wouldn't know what the cards were. And then eventually the internet came along with, like, you can't stop information. It just, you can't. <laughs> like, if you don't do it, other people will compile it and the information will be there. And Richard's pilot said, oh, okay, we'll post that. Like, when Magic first came out, we didn't post what the cards were. We didn't post a list of cards. We didn't put rarities on the cards. Like, there was, everything was kind of a mystery. And then Richard probably gave up a couple of years and said, like, okay, I can't. I, I, the internet's going to be fine. Here's the information. <laughs> that to me is one of the things that's really what was really interesting about the original, like the early days of Magic. Is I would go into a comic shop and open up a binder of cards and just see stuff I'd never seen before. Yeah. And you know there was no there was nowhere to really find it. So you would just be like, oh my gosh, look, it's Sword of the Ages. What does that do? You know? And you're like, okay. Yeah. The reason. So the very first magazine to ever print rarities for Magic was called Shadis Magazine. Um, it was like a role playing magazine. And they, they just opened up a bunch of boxes and did their best guess. And they were wrong in some stuff, you know. Um, but we, we traded based on that rarity for a, a while, because that's all, all we had. 
Um, and you know, it was the wild wasn't really that big. It's very interesting. A lot of this was the, you, people read what magic you take for granted now. Like you start playing magic, and there's infinite things to go read and, and learn, and that just wasn't in the early days. You just didn't have that. Also, think about like updating the price list every thirty days, <laughs> which is wild. Uh, <laughs> So then, uh, so now we have wizards.com. So we're moving into the, er, the, the true early internet era. I mean, do um, dojo, can I talk about dojo for a second? Yeah, or well, dojo dojo's, dojo's next. Dojo's, but dojo pre predates wizards.com. Well, let's pop over to that then. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, got, we've got Mike Flores with the dojo, right? Um, and who's the beatdown? But you, you have some specific stuff you want to talk about with the dojo. Well, no, the one issue is, so the, the idea of the dojo, so who, raise your hand if you know what the dojo even is. Okay, so basically, what was Frank's last name? Frank, um, sounds like K. Uh, what, what was his last name? Carsten. Carsten. Oh, Carsten. No, no, not Frank Carsten. Different, different Frank. No, uh, like Kukumoto. What? Kukumoto. Kukumoto, Frank Kukumoto. Um, he came up with this really cool idea, which was, what if there was a place that all magic players could sort of talk in the same place? The Usenet wasn't really great for that, and he would sort of, he didn't have any money or anything. He just would like, it just became a place of pride for people to, and so the top names in Magic just started writing sort of articles essentially. They would just write things and post it there. And there was a period of time for early Magic. It was like the hot spot for you want to talk about Magic. This is where you went. You went to the dojo. Um, and I, I, was, I was mentioning earlier that I actually had a reoccurring feature in the dojo. I did a trivia contest and the way it worked was day one I'd ask a question. It was multiple choice. Everybody who got it wrong was eliminated. And then day two, anybody who got it right could answer. And I kept going until only one person was left. And then I'd start over with it, basically. So um, that was my, my dojo contribution. So well, well, while we're on the dojo, I, 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 I did pull uh, Mike Flores for an interview. He couldn't make it to the panel, but I wanted to, I wanted to play his interview. Uh, spoiler alert, this interview was 27 minutes long. Mike will talk. Um, so I had to do a little bit of editing, uh, but the, real, the, the whole interview will la later be available online. But I did want to make sure that we, uh, you know, he, he was very important in the early stages of, uh, of magic content creation. So I wanted to make sure that we got, uh, got his word here. Sometimes people ask me uh, if I knew who was the beat down of a Psycho like Grey article when I wrote it. And the answer was, I was really high on this article called Investment that I heard in 1998. Nobody's ever heard of Investment, but I thought it was just an investment. It was this whole thing about how to count cards. And um, I wrote Who's the Beat Down, and I sent it in, and I thought it was pretty good. But uh, the, the biggest like strategy article that was of any, any consequence at the time was Schools of Magic by Rob Hahn. Um, I realized within three days that I had written the second best magic article of all time, at a minimum, because I already changed the language. So I found out people emailed me, people emailed me instead of texting back, then don't be able to come to your slide. People are just, they're not talking about your article. They are talking your article, right? Like, they were at tournaments that weekend, and they're like, oh, who's the beatdown, right? And then, and I was just like, that I already changed the language, right? So, by the summer of 1999, because um, I worked for Rob, right? So I was just like, oh, you wrote the best one. I only wrote the second best one. It made a lot of food that, like, it was that how lasting and important it was. And I think that the thing that um, was different or important about it is that, not that Who's the Beat Down is so ingenious in and of itself, but I kind of created this subgenre of taking magic thoughts seriously and systematically that didn't exist before. Just curious, who knows what who's the beatdown is? Sure oh, great question, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, you know, I'll, I'll let you because you have a much better idea of how, how to so discuss this. Basically, the idea of who's the beatdown is it's just a way of thinking about how magic gameplay works. Um, and there's a lot of concepts like tempo mm -hmm. and just the idea that like one person, one person's trying to win, or the other person's trying to stop them from winning. And so the idea is one of the two players is the beatdown. They're on the road to victory. They're about to win. And the other person's trying to stop them from winning. And are you the guy trying to win? Or are you the guy trying to stop them from winning? And one of the ideas of the article is that it can change. Who's the beat down can change during the course of it. But it just really free framed in a way that it never done before about just a, a strategic way to think of, of, of magic. And 
it was very foundational in that once it happened, then everything started getting built up, like how discussions got, got built on top of it. Um, and it, that's why, it's like, we talked about, like, classic articles. It's one of the classic articles. Yeah, this was foundational, really, yeah. Yeah, very foundational. Um, and it was the kind of article that, like, one thing about the dojo is you would go read the dojo and then everyone would talk about it, right? And you wanted to be the, the people, what people were talking about. And then one of the things I did on the do list was I would try to find people that were good at the dojo and put them to do list. <laughs> that was my secret sauce, but like, I could read the dojo and put them to do list. So. All right, so the next question I asked uh, Mike was what changed in magic that led to the theory discussed in Who's the Beatdown? Do we not have. Uh... Roommate, one of my best friends, uh, original dojo character. Al Tran was playing for top eight. In a matchup, he was playing uh, a white weenie, like a five color white weenie deck that Landy Ho, you might also know that Land, you know, multiple, great to be top eight competitor Landy Ho had uh, won a qualifier with. So Al was playing Land's uh, white weenie deck, and he was playing against the slide deck, right? He was playing against the red deck. So what ended up happening was uh, Al made the cardinal mistake uh, that no one should ever make, uh, which is that he lost the roll. And his opponent played a first turn, uh, first turn capital. And Al's got, Al's got uh, a sort of supply shares in his hand. And I'm thinking, like, just open mana, just send this over here. But he's greedy. He wants to save his uh, lightning bolt for the jackal pup. Long story short, the jackal pup keeps, does a ton of damage. You know, Al ends up having to plow it anyway. Then he takes a ball light in the jaw. Everything goes wrong, right? And um, I hope I'm remembering that, right? If you read who's the beat end, probably have a, a more precise thing. This has been 25 years for me. Uh, but it, it's something like this, right? So a jackal pup and a ball of lightning versus the source of pleasures when you're waiting on a lightning bolt is the is really the setup here. Al didn't understand that he wasn't the aggressor, right? So uh, a white weenie deck, you know, Savannah Lions and Lightning Bolt and uh, Sotari Priest, like that's the aggressive deck, but not in this context. His opponent has jackal pup, which is offensively just as fast as Savannah Lions, he's got ball lightning, which is faster, he's got fire blast finish. Al actually has to use his resources to not get run over, not to try to run his opponent over, right? And if you think about like, things like his mana base, his mana base becomes a potential liability, right? Like maybe he's taking damage from his lands, you know? Maybe his lands just don't come out perfectly because he's not one color. And so I just saw this, I'm like, Al, missed, like, it's not that they don't understand how their deck worked if they were playing against a you know, a blank screen, right? But they didn't understand how their deck worked in the context that they were sitting in front of. And I can't figure something out, which was that if that's the case, right, what if all deck assignment, what if all deck roles, what if all decks exist on a spectrum of fluidity, not on, not in like hard spots, right? Just like, okay, I'm playing Suicide Black, I'm the beat temple. Well, you're not always the beat temple, right? Like, you know, I'm playing Blue White Control, I'm the control, right? Like, no, you're not always the control, right? Like, you know, how does your deck interact with the combo deck, right? How does your, you know, people are like, oh, well, this, there's this paradigm of combo and control and, and beat down. I'm like, well, okay, let's have a, con a control deck, right? I have a red-white deck that's just nothing but creature removal. Like, you're not very controlling when you're playing against a blue-white deck that has counter spells. Or you're not very controlling if you're playing against a mid-range green-white uh, earn engine deck that can cast the card up again, right? Like, you're literally not controlling anything. You're just getting your whole board blown up, even though you have nothing but creature removal. So I was just like, well, if all of these things exist on a spectrum, then what we have to do is think about how do we contextualize the, the deck that we're playing in front of us against the opponent that we're playing, and once we figure out what that context should be, how does that potentially adjust how we should play, right? And so obviously um, this has had a, a lasting impact on how people think about uh, think about magic, right? And I think that the simplest thing to say about it is we, you know, there's just not fixed positions in space, right? Everything's fluid, and that this, the greatest skill is figuring out where you are um, on the spectrum, and by figuring that out, you will have the best chance of making the best decisions on a go forward basis, right? So, uh, just in, in the modern world, my friend Lanny Wong, who I have a podcast with right now, is by Colony. Uh, I was trying to explain how to play Burn to a kid at a, at a local tournament. So look, a lot of people sit down and they, they, they look at their hand and they start making the wrong decision at, you know, turn X and lanes no. They start making the wrong decision on turn one, right? And the reason is they just 
don't understand the, like, the fundamental context of how their net works. Um, when, when they're sitting down in a certain spot, right? And uh, you gain a lot of percentage once you figure that out correctly, right? And um, the biggest, uh, the best example I can think of is when people make fun of burn players and they're just like, oh, well, did a really great job of dealing 17, right? They don't 17 because they play well, right? So they, they're like, they're aiming to the face or they're not aiming to the face or maybe creatures, like, you have to figure out what the right thing to aim at is at the right speed and then you can win a whole lot. Does that answer your question? <laughs> So then I asked him, how does Who's the Beatdown compare to its peer articles when it was debuted? Who's the Beatdown, the, the, like I said, the best match article was written before Who's the Beatdown was probably Schools of Magic by Rob. And Rob wrote and rewrote Schools of Magic many times. So he's constantly kept it fresh. But it was like really, it's kind of like a metagame breakdown in the time when the metagame didn't move as fast, right? So uh, that was that. And then, John Schuler, who I think I mentioned uh, elsewhere in, in this interview, kind of had, had invented the Turnip Report. So uh, Turnip Reports already existed before I started playing seriously. Uh, and people basically would go play a PTQ, talk about their deck. Sometimes they'd put their deck list. Oftentimes they wouldn't because decks were secret back then. But they would describe their deck, and they would describe the path that they took, um, to, to usually to win. People didn't typically write a Turnip Report if they didn't win. Uh, and one of the things that was super inspirational to me was Rob actually wrote a tournament report for me to do that he won, and I really wanted to be a professional magic player. I, want, I really wanted to, like, I'm good enough or whatever. And I, I never played that game, but I wanted to be a professional magic player. Uh, and so I had this correlation in my head. I was just like, oh, well, I know who this guy is because I read schools of magic. And I was like, oh, so there's this correlation between writing good magic articles or writing good usenet posts, really. There was no dojo yet, so there was no other ones, I'd say. Writing good usenet posts and then sharing your information and then being good at magic. And so, like, I had this equation in my head by winter of 1995, right? So that was in my head before I had ever played in a, in a, um, in a magic. So you think about like, what magic content was. Most of the good magic content was on usenet and rec dot trading cards dot magic dot strategy was the most frequented one although like brian hacker posted in dot misc i think uh and uh so that a lot of that was there or you bought books so like george baxter wrote books i own books that were written by george baxter uh and so that's yep yeah, there you go um that so that's where that's where i showed him the book at that point <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what the first magic article would be. Like, even, I, I think back, like, Brian Weissman wrote a primer on how to play Urza's Block Limited for the dojo. Uh, I followed it and I topped four in a PTQ that, that weekend after reading um, Brian Weissman's. That was the very first one. I don't know that I would even count that as an article. It was just like, or I guess you could say, like, I guess there were magic articles in the Duelist. But they're not really written in a, with you know a, a high level strategic mindset. It, Baxter also uh, was like written from a very biased position. Like people talk about decklist being Baxterized. Like Baxter would like intentionally make the decklist worse in his books so so as to not give away technology. Like, he basically had people who were like doing well at the national level or winning PTQs, right? Because it wasn't even that much pro tour. Right, but they were like, there been like one pro tour or something like that, maybe two pro tours, and people were winning constructive ETQs. We're just getting like the opportunity to write, or Baxter was writing, and they were all writing lots. Like that's that's the thing. Like they were writing bad deck. Go look at Deep Magic. Like look at the deck. Editorialized a little bit there. <laughs> like Baxter was a good pro tour player. He never played any of the decks that he he would have put in one of his books. Never. Right. Like so. Um, you uh, and th that's not. It was a different world. Like the amount of information that we have is completely different than it is today. So it's, it's hard to, to lay judgment. I'm just saying, from the perspective of what magic quote unquote articles were back then, people weren't giving up their deck lists. When they were, they were lying. And um, there wasn't really any transparency. Uh, the best content was some kind of theoretical strategic stuff coming from Rob in term reports. And there weren't a lot of term reports yet. So Jamie Wakefield was writing them, John Schuler was writing them, Rob wrote, uh, wrote some. Uh, but 
You know, they, they hadn't become the art form. They, you know, um, by 97, by 97, I'd already played my first portrait at this point, but by 97, I think Brian Hacker perfected the term before, but, uh, and Who's the Beat Down comes out in 99. So, there was, there was Hacker already, Hacker's the best. Well, there you go, Mike Flores, everybody. Um, I want to again thank Mike Flores for taking the time to, uh, to spend that with me. Uh, it's, it's very enlightening to get, to get a lot of that from the ground up because it's, it's a history that you don't often hear. Um, so moving on, uh, you know, you had chat, you had AIM, you had IRC, all these, all these ways that me and my friends would be like, okay, I have a deck list. And then you'd like post it onto your like away message for, for AIM and be like, this is what I'm playing, you know. Uh, we'd go to the store or whatever, and, and you know your friends would look back and be like, "Oh yeah, you played this. Okay, cool. We're going to talk about it." Um, and then of course Usenet. Um, so then then we move into era three, which is the the pro blog era, um, and the main focus of this was content creation uh, with a bend towards competitive results and and star making. So a lot of the people that we know now as like big pro players came came from this era or started in the, in the previous era and then came into this era. Oh yeah. Definitely. Um, it is the after the dojo. The dojo eventually Frank. I, I don't know. Tired of the dojo. I mean, he didn't. He didn't. Have, he never bit anybody. Like he, he just did a lot, a lot, a lot, and eventually it worked out just because it was a lot of work. And then there were different sort of sites, usually that sold magic, that figured out that oh, if we write articles, people will come and read the articles, and then hopefully the life stuff bots rather than somewhere else. Um, and yeah, Star City. It, yeah, it's, it's really amazing how many of the most uh, well-known Magic players come from these groups, really. You look at that era of content, LSB, Paulo, many of the people who were still at the top, Reed Duke, many of the most well-known players were writing for Channel Player, Ball Star City Games, TCB Player, and that really was what content was at the time. It was very focused on competitive play from competitive players. And uh, there was some really awesome content to come out of that era, for sure. I remember there being a team wars between Star City Games and Channel Fireball, the content producers, people switching sides uh, from site to site in their pro teams. Really interesting era. That was big news whenever someone would switch sides. You were like, it was, you know, it was like a red and blue team, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got Channel Fireball, which was the godfather of the video, of video content at the time. Because not many places were doing video content. Now that's like all, you know, that, that's the standard. Um, but uh, at the time, the, the, the whole concept Channel Fireball was the you'd go to see the channel, right? Like, that was sort of the idea. Uh, and, and, you know, like you said, we have uh, Louis Scott Vargas, we've got Reed Duke, uh, Brian Kibler, Paula Vita De La, De La Rosa, uh, Domino De La Rosa. Um, and then you have Star City, and Star City was more for, like, the tournament grinder. Uh, and it was an alternative path from the Pro Tour. It wasn't like, it was set aside from the Pro Tour, and still is, you know, uh, but, but that was... Uh, sort of a, a, almost a competition with the Pro Tour. You could do, you could have more Magic events that weren't necessarily tied to this one pathway to becoming a professional Magic player. And I think it's also worth noting that one of the best ways to become a content producer was to do well in those tournaments. I know, like for Star City, if you want an invitational, part of your reward is you to write articles on your site that many people are going to read. So that was kind of the pathway towards content production. And another important thing, early in the day, the payoffs of the Pro Tour early on were not very high. That a lot of sort of being a Pro Tour player was writing articles and stuff and getting money from that. That was a big part of sort of existing. Yeah, if you talk to a lot of pros, they'll tell you that that's actually their main source of income. You know, starting with uh, winnings is very high variance and up and down, but being able to write an article each week for Star City Games or Channel Fireball was how a lot of people could make magic their full time job. And then we have uh, Hipsters of the Coast, uh, and this is, this is towards more of the later end of Era 3, and this was a, a, a website that I started. Uh, we've got Rich Stein in the back, uh, one of the other contributors, uh, the president of Hipsters of the Coast as well. Um, and this was a more community bin, so you start to see in, in the Era 3 uh, a movement from pro players uh, to more community and casual, uh, casual players, and, and sort of getting this more grassroots uh, grassroots Magic the Gathering experience that you definitely didn't get with, you know, say Star City or, or uh, Channel Fireball because we weren't necessarily going after pros. We were looking for the everyman. When did Hipster start? Hipster started in 2012. Uh, the first article was uh, a 
review of the pre-release, a review of the uh, cards that I liked from Return to Ravnica. So, by the way, can we jump in now back to the... Yeah, let's go back. back. Yes, yeah, yeah. Magic.com. Yes. Wizards.com, sorry. Um, so, uh, Wizards.com, it had a website early on, but not anything to speak of. And basically, in early, early in 2000, um, the brand manager of Magic went to Bill Rose, who was the VP of uh, R&D, and said, okay, we want a website. And so Bill came to me, just because I, I had the communications background, Bill goes, we want a website. Um, and so I followed all the things I learned from communication school. Uh, I hired um, Aaron Forsythe to be the editor-in-chief. Uh, and we started writing articles. Uh, making, that's making Magic started then. Um, latest Developments was the, the developer article that Aaron started writing. Um, and we had, I think we had like, uh, Ben Flyway wrote an article. Um, sort of the um, BDM, uh, Brian David Marshall wrote an article. Um, a lot of people you might know that, that this was a lot of, we grabbing a lot of magic people that we could write. Uh, and unlike Star City, we weren't focused on pro play, that we weren't trying to sell, we were trying to sell magic at whole rather than, you know, card sleeves or whatever. So we were aimed at much more like, hey, here's what's cool about magic. And our competitive advantage, I guess, as a site was, well, we have behind the scenes information. We can preview cards. We can tell you how stuff is made. And so we really heavily into that. We did, when we first started, we had a design column, a development column, and then a Timmy column, a Johnny column, and a Spike column. Yeah. You know, we did it. Although we lean more on Spike history rather than like competitive play, how do you better competitive play? Because everybody else was doing how do you better competitive play. So we go from the early Wizards website yeah. till about 2002 when you guys added daily content. Right, 2002, that's what yeah. I was involved with, was 2002. Uh, in January of 2002, I believe. Um, that's when like Big Magic started. That's when uh, a lot of the early stuff started. And we also we, we started doing things like um, what was it called? Uh, the Orb of you remember the Orb of Insight? We did this thing where you could put words in and it would tell you how many times that word appeared in, in the upcoming set. Um, and so like, you could like figure things out about the set, but you couldn't figure out you know. Um, and we, we, did, we, uh, we did the very first you make the card, for example, where we let people vote and we let them make a card based on votes. So we, a lot of what we were trying to do with that was just, hey, we wanted to build a more casual community and, and sort of doing a lot of what the duels was doing, but now do it online because the duels went away. Yeah. Man, the, the, early, the early website too, uh, it, just to throw back here, I remember this. Like this was what I went on like in, in high school, like yeah. when I had like a lunch period and, like break and I would go onto this specific site and there was a point where, where it had like, I don't know if you guys have put this on there, but there was like links to other sites that also had magic. And yeah, one of yeah, them- we started doing that later yeah. on. Yeah. And I remember one of them had like just a fan fiction site or like a jokes, magic jokes you could tell, yeah. you know, like it was, it was a wild time. And then, to, and then to see it go from that to this and to like, and to where it is now where it's, it's uh, you know, it, it is, a, literally like a magazine that you, you know, you just, all the content comes out daily. Yes. So it's updated I mean, constantly. I mean, my training uh, in communications was like, there was content every day. You wanted to go every day, go at the same time, just to train people to come every day to look at the content. So now we're going into 3.5. Uh, th there's not really a 3.5 era, but I did want to jump in and talk about podcasting a little bit because some of the most well-known podcasts are are also now still some of the most consumed content in the game. Uh, limited Resources, I'm sure many of you know Marshall and LSV's uh, Limited Resources podcast that goes deep and does deep dives into, uh, into Limited. Uh, and of course, we have Drive to Work with Mark. Mark has been in every single era so far. <laughs> Save some era for the rest of us, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's that interesting for me is how do we communicate with the player just kept changing? You know, what do players expect? Uh, the history for me, by the way, the, the drive to work, I went to a San Diego Comic Con and Kevin Smith was giving a talk. And Kevin Smith you know, has a podcast. And he just said, he goes, you know, anybody can do a podcast, just get a microphone. And I had this idea that I wanted to do a really short podcast, but I said, I, I just like to do a podcast, I just didn't have to listen to them. Uh, so I said, I want to do a 30 minute podcast, and they figured out I had a 30 minute drive, and so that's the. And I had no time, so I'm like, okay, I'll do my drive. 
So, yeah, of course, we have limited resources. We have drive to work. Uh, the Command Zone, uh, I don't know if many of you know this, the Command Zone started as a podcast. Uh, and then I also do a podcast. I'm throwing myself in here. This is a shameless plug. Uh, I do a podcast. It's legacy focused called Eternal Dirtles with my host, Phil Bleckman. Uh, so, and that's our, the, the, and that's the podcast era. Like it was, it, it's very guerrilla. Like you can, it, like you said, you can just, as long as you own a recording device, you could make Magic the Gathering content. And that's kind of where we came from that. Then we have the, I would call this the current era, the, the vlog slash independent era. Um, and this, uh, you know, I think, uh, Seth, you'll be doing a lot more uh, of the lifting here. Um, but, uh, you know, this, is, this was sort of the rise of being able to go from having uh, card sales be the driving force of your financial factor as far as making, making content to things like Patreon. People want to see your content, so they're paying you to make that content. So you can sort of branch out and make the kind of content that you want, which is where we get the rise of uh, EDH content creators and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so we've got uh, MTG Goldfish, Tolarian Community College is, you know, it would be very cool if the professor won a pro tour, but that's not what he's, what he's here for, you know? Um, the command zone, of course, there's, there's your EDH, and then you have Loading Ready Run. Which is, uh, you know, they make a completely different style of content than, say, Star City Games makes. You know, the, the, being able to make a, a, a content base that's completely different from the, what was traditionally the more uh, successful style of content. Yeah, that's, I'll tell you, the history of the professor is really interesting one. I don't know if people know it, but he started out, I think his early videos were like, are these good sleeves and stuff like that? And then what happened was he lost his job basically. Like he was a, a teacher and he got laid off and he's just like, well maybe I just do this. And then it, it, it worked out. Like it, you know, it, his it, Patreon it, blew up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he just dedicated himself and all, like it became that became a job. Yeah, and I think that technology played a big role in all this too. You had YouTube come along, you had Twitch come along. So it's really a democratization yeah. of magic content where before if you wanted to make magic content, your best pathway to that was to like get really good at magic and win a pro tour or get really good at magic and win SCG Open. When all of a sudden with YouTube and Twitch, you didn't have to do any of that. You could just sit down in your house and make a video and put it on YouTube and if people liked it, they would watch it and they would support you and like professor you could eventually like make your career out of that. So I think that played a huge role in this era of becoming a vet. Now we're going to get to the uh, saffron olive section of the. Uh, I would say the previous section has been has been the Mark Rosewater section, but now we're going to the saffron olive section, uh, and and I, I want to talk a little bit more in detail about MTG Goldfish, um, which is known for its comprehensive card database, uh, deck building tools, metagame analysis, um, and it's just a valuable community resource. Yeah. So. Uh, Goldfish actually started, interestingly, uh, because it was very hard to find prices of Magic Online cards, and that was what actually was well, what brought the site around initially, but it became so much more than that. And I think one of the things that we realized at Goldfish really early was Magic content was very focused on competitive play, and competitive play is awesome, and there's uh, like it's a great aspect of Magic, but along at the same time, we see the rise of Commander was happening, and casual play view was becoming a much bigger thing, and that was an aspect of Magic content that was really missing during the kind of the pro Star City Games Channel Fireball era. And I think that that's something that we were really able to embrace and start making, like, I'm not a pro player, I'm never gonna try to grind to a pro tour, but I can make fun decks and uh, be entertaining as I play them. And that's something that was just missing from Magic content at that time. And I think that's something that really led to the rise of this era and Goldfish in specific. So I, I want to highlight some of the some of the creators for Goldfish, uh, and have you highlight them, obviously. Uh, so we've got Krim. Yeah, so Krim, uh, he was actually a, a pretty a pretty spiky player. He, uh, he was the tournament grinder of the group. But even Krim has uh, become much more of a fun deck player. Usually, sometimes he still likes his control deck, so those slip in there. But in general, uh, yeah, so Krim does a little bit of everything, but mostly standard content. He's really uh, loves best of one on Arena, which has been another new innovation to Magic in just the last few years. Uh, and then we have Tomer. Yeah, so Tomer runs the Commander channel for MTG Goldfish, and I mentioned that earlier. Commander's been one of the biggest changes in the last decade or so of Magic when uh, it wasn't even really good. It was like a, a backroom and tournament thing in the early 2000s, and now it's the most popular way to play the game. Uh, so to the point where we have an entire YouTube channel that's dedicated to just showing off Commander decks and Commander gameplay that Tomer's in charge of. 
then we have a friend of the show, a personal friend of mine, uh, Joe Dyer. Yeah, Joe, uh, Joe writes a bunch of articles for us, and I think it's really cool that a lot of the stuff from the earliest days of magic that we were talking about with uh, the articles and so forth, that's still taking place in this era, too. There's still written articles. Joe does a lot of that, the, the neck decks and metagame breakdowns that maybe would have been at home like 20 years ago. You can still find that today. He's still kind of carrying on that legacy. And he also does the legacy data collection as a completely different thing, which is a real huge resource for, for legacy players, basically giving you metagame breakdowns like on a like on an Excel spreadsheet, like very by the numbers, like very crunchy, crunchy data that like all the legacy players really love. And that's one of the biggest differences from the early era too, that before people were hiding their deck list, you can find deck list. And now every deck list is published the hours after the tournament and the full breakdowns of the metagame and the matchup. So it's definitely been a big change as well. Uh, and, and we talked about the professor. Uh, I, I, I wanted to add professor's origin story here, but we, you did such a great job. No, you're great. That's perfect. You did such a great job of, of, of talking about it because that, that was a really cool thing to me. Is like he came out. He, you know, he he was a college. He was like a county college professor, and he lost his job. You know, he didn't have tenure, and um, he just came on and was like, "Hey, like, look, I'm going to try and do this for a living." Um, if you will support me, I will continue to do this as best I possibly can. And that was a real paradigm shift for, for I think, all of Magic content was this guy deciding that, like, he could do this for a living if you helped him out and supported him. And many people did, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm a Patreon supporter of The Professor. So uh, it's it, it just really cool that he was able to take that and then turn it into his career. And he's had this whole persona uh, and it's created so many opportunities for him, and it's just a really cool thing to, to have, you know? And then we have Loading Ready Run, which, uh, you know, I talked about a little bit before, but they're like a sketch comedy group. It's so, it's so vastly different than uh, any of the other content that sort of come out before and into this era, and it wouldn't, again, it wouldn't be available if it wasn't for things like, do you, do you remember there was a point in, in, in the history of YouTube that you couldn't post a video longer than 10 minutes? Yeah. So, like, I watched an entire movie in 10-minute clips at one point. Like, water, Watership Down, the animated version, I remember specifically watching it in 10-minute clips. Uh, there were, like, 30 of them or something like that. It was wild. But you couldn't do that sort of content. Um, and I think the first time I really saw uh, Loading Ready Run and, and really gained a perspective on what they were doing was during the first Modern Master set. Because uh, they all kind of got in on that, and, and they all had this really cool content for the, mo the first Modern Master set. I'd rather be proven. Yeah. Also, yeah. And you know, they and they have more than just magic content. They've got a lot of uh, you know nerd nerd news content and stuff like that. So it's it's cool to see that you can do magic content and do other content, and people will, will follow and watch along in either way. And that kind of brings us to the end of the eras. Like the next question is like, what will the next era bring? Will there be another era? You know. I, I think we are here entering the next era, which I think is uh, the TikTok era. The, the TikTok era. Form. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, that arguably is an era that's going on now. We've seen some creators like Maldhound, Maldhound yeah, become very popular, making two, three minute videos. They're very fun and just kind of taming and fast. And so I think that's where Magic content is heading right now. That like short form content, yeah. yeah. And and YouTube Shorts has the same kind of concept, yeah. yeah. Instagram, yeah. Most of the sites have something similar, yeah. So I'm gonna. We have uh, we have about ten minutes left. Uh, I'm gonna open the floor for uh, for any questions you guys might have for uh, Mark and Seth. I got one. You're right. Um, in the mid aughts, was there any rivalry? Speaking of Marvel earlier, with Upper Deck and Versus System, because that was kind of I went from Yu-Gi-Oh to Yu Yu Hakusho to Versus System, and that's still my favorite game, sorry. <laughs> but was there any rock because they, you know, Pro Tour and they had, you know, you had Kadeem Pro Tours? I mean, I don't know lost any is a rising tide rises all boats. Like, get as many people as possible into the trading card game industry, you know, into the world, and hey, they'll get exposed to magic. I mean, that, that's, um, and some of them will eventually come home and play magic because the magic really good game. So, I, I love seeing new trading card games. That's awesome. Whenever there's a new one, I'm like, great, they will introduce new people that weren't wasn't introduced before. And um, so it wasn't really rivalry. I mean, I, I wasn't like, they weren't a threat or anything. So in some ways, I, I think it was really good for us because it just brought more people to, to trade for Over here. Hi, uh, this is a question for Mr. Rosewater. Um, so you have a lot of the Bank City Dead Leaks 
that links on the magic site that anyone can send to you, and I really appreciate you going out of your way for that. But is there any possibility of a uh, like widespread full restoration of all the missing articles? I'm not sure Wizards is going to do that, but I will. Off the record, um, there is someone who's compiled all the old articles that has a link to all of them that you can get access to, that I have access to, um, that has all the articles on it. So there is a way to get to all the old articles. It's not on our site, but it does exist. But the Wayback Machine also is really helpful with stuff like that if you've ever used that site. That's what I use to find a lot of the articles that aren't there anymore. They, so, uh, real quick, they're there. There's, a, there's no great link to get to yeah. them. There's, there's ways to get to them. Uh, I wish we made it easier. As someone who's made content constantly, it, it sends me to no end. There's awesome, awesome content. They decided to, to keep all the links to making magic, so that stuff exists. So if you find a broken link for making magic, I can get fixed. But there's lots of other amazing articles I get. I wish it was easier access to. In the middle here? Yeah, there is you, an extension called Oh, excellent. I didn't know about that. Thank you. Uh, in the back here, right here? Um, I started making videos on content breaking down that and stuff before, before video days and like, before interviews. But I was wondering, what are the resources for, um, like, I was trying to explain magic to a co-worker, and she's like, what's mana? What's your thoughts on, like, resources of, like, explaining, like, the root roots? Like, what is mana? Uh, what is tapping land? What is... What are what do creature abilities stand for? Like, what are there short resources out there that like will actually your videos that will actually break down like what each segment is like man, a monster, artifacts, and the speed of that and stuff like that. Honestly, I I haven't seen a whole lot like that. I think that might be something that's missing a little bit. I think a lot of content creators are maybe so enfranchised in magic that they skip over that stuff and go right to the deck. So that might be something that we could use more of, really, that really basic stuff. I don't know, is there any well, I think we just went through a period we were trying to do those videos, and what we found was the the better way for our purposes to get into the magic was the send to like Arena, and Arena has, has an onloading thing that does very well. So rather than trying to make watch videos, it's like convince them to go to this site that has a means to teach you. Yeah, Arena does have a really good tutorial as well. So if you're looking for some place to appoint a brand new player, that's a, a really good direction to go. Right here. Um, so with the internet, like there's a lot more information available, but there's also a lot more differing opinions and maybe people voice like their own frustrations or they have their own agendas. How do you find navigating all the criticism and scrutiny and you know, everything that you're doing? And how does that change over the years? So there's people complaining about magic. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, um, I mean, one of the things in general is one of the trends and kind of pandemic on, uh, there definitely is a mood on the internet that the little, it just became more okay to say things that you wouldn't have said before and it's definitely gotten a little meat meaner sort of. Um, I don't know how to combat that. I mean, I, I the, I don't know which people were nice on the internet, but it, it, it definitely, as a trend I see, I mean, as someone who gets lots of, you know, feedback, um, it, the, the tone, the tone is down a little darker, but that's not everybody, it's flat, I mean, I, I get a lot of feedback, a lot of, it's very positive, a lot of people, you know, and are, some of it is just, hey, can you do this thing I'd like to see, and that, that's great, I mean, I love feedback, I, I, I like feedback that's, you know, you don't need to be mean your feedback, just say what, what you want, um, but it is something that I struggle with that is, trying to create positivity. I'd love to see more positivity in online spaces. Yeah, I think that there's no really great answer to it, but I think it's one of those, the be the change you want to see and think about how you're interacting with people on the internet and remembering that there's a real person on the other side. Like, it's easy to think of, you know, Mark as uh, some baseless person at LOTC when you're talking to a real human being here. So I think that's important to remember as well. I mean, one, one of my rules, for example, on my blog is I'm never, I'm never mean. I'm never mean. I mean, I'll sometimes be blunt about things, and, you know, but, uh, and occasionally I'm snarky, I try not to be snarky, but um, I, I just try to be honest and straightforward, and I write, mirror what you want, and try, you know, 
Um, I, I think if, if you pro project sort of uh, an attitude, it helps the people project that. <laughs> you had a question. Um, first, I go to MTG Goldfish all the time. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and saffron olive is great. Okay. <laughs> thank you. It's awesome. You guys got to try. Okay, Mark, I have to ask you. Being a librarian. Yeah. Um, I'm not talking fiction. I'm yeah. talking about something that can be geared towards um, young people instead mm -hmm. of it being video, which they're all into the video. They're all up on the internet stuff. Mm -hmm. Something that I could say, hey, you need to read this book that will enhance them to learn more about magic because magic is a great teaching tool. Yes. We're, I mean, one of the things that's I mean, been ongoing, that's been true at Wizards ever since I've been there is, what are the on-ramps? How do we get people into the game? Um, there's a period in time, for example, that the way we teach people is comic books. That we like, we, we and you can look through it, there's pictures of showing you. Um, yes. We have, we've tried a lot of different things. We've not had great success with graphic novels. We try and um, we keep trying. It is tough, I mean, one of the things right now is, um, Generation Z is a very different crowd from a gaming perspective. Like Generation X and, and um, um, Millennials, Millennials are, grew up with a little more games, like, or how they think games is a little bit different. And um, trying to understand, we, we spend a lot of time trying to understand Gen Z because it's a very right, it's a short term, and it's very fast videos, and you know, how, how, how do you speak in a way that's, that's approachable? And it's, it's something we're still learning. So I mean, I, I don't know any Gen Z out there that want to produce content that sort of speaks to fellow Gen Zers would be great. Because it, it's, it's true. Once you get it out there, I'll promote it. <laughs> we have you right here? Yeah, this question. Let me get two more questions probably after this. Yeah, a lot of uh, creators now seem to be talking about the decline of YouTube and the death of YouTube. And I just wonder from your perspective, do, do, you, do you begin to see that? Do you feel that the short form content is, is, is going to be replacing YouTube content or is it adding to it? Oh, I definitely think that short form, uh, short form content is definitely uh, augmenting YouTube. I think Magic YouTube, as far as I can see, is doing better than it's ever done, at least as long as I've been doing this, which is like 10 years now. There's, uh, it's a great place, uh, there's very great discovery there. There's tons of new creators who are popping up and finding success. So I think that uh, YouTube's doing really well with Magic, at least. In the grand scheme of the world, maybe it's not doing as well, but I think the short form content is definitely something that will augment uh, YouTube rather than replace it. We have you, and then you'll be the last question. I wanted to ask about, like, on a grander scale. I know there were talks a couple of years back about films or TV shows and different advertisements for the magic genre. Mm. Is that still an open thing? I mean, we we still have a, a deal with Netflix. It's not it's not over anything. Um, the, the original partners are we've changed. I mean, it's I can't really talk about it, but it's it's not dead. It, 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 things are being done. Um, we would love. I mean, Magic's never had a high property entertainment thing ever. Uh, we would like to, and and that's one of the things about getting stuff like like uh, like a Netflix show is there's a lot of awareness that comes from it. Like here's one of the crazy things about Magic is we are like Hasbro's number one game by far by far. Um, but our awareness, like our awareness is still in the 50s. Like, you know, um, Monopoly has an awareness of like 98%. Like if you go to, you know, you ask the average American, 98% of what Monopoly is. We're in the 50s. And so, hey, it'd be great if, if there's a lot of people that, that have never heard of magic. Forget played magic. You say magic, they don't know what you're talking about. They've never heard of it. That's half the public. So we, we, we can do better at getting more people that know magic. One of the things that I think is, is interesting about that is when, uh, you know, I work, I work in the, the public sector, so like most of the people that I work with don't have any idea what magic is, uh, and they're like, oh, what are you doing this weekend? I'm talking about this panel, and um, I was like, well, it's Dungeons and Dragons plus poker, uh, because Dungeons and Dragons has, I, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but does Dungeons and Dragons have a better, like, well, Dungeons and Dragons yeah. has a much higher awareness. Yeah, because that's what I was going for. Yeah, I mean, the thing I have to do is we made a billion dollars last year. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> How much do you think Universes Beyond will help with that market? Oh, is it a way that will help more players recognize the yes. magic? I mean, Universes Beyond is the next big push for us. I mean, Lord of the Rings was the best one set of all time, right? So, um... What we've discovered is magic is awesome. We need more people to learn magic. When you play magic, it's really fun. Um, and so there's people that love other things and you know, come play magic with, and in some ways it's like, hey, we have a great new Lord of the Rings game. Did you enjoy this Lord of the Rings game? Well, guess 
play. There's other games that you can play with it, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, UB, it's been very, very, very good. Final question. I mean, AI is an upcoming force that will be dealt with. But, I mean, I, it's hard that AI will not be involved in some way. It's just too present of what the next sort of version of things is. Um, Wizards is really dedicated to making sure, like, we want to support people and we want to support artists. And, you know, so, like, we want to have actual humans painting our paintings and doing our work. So, but that's, you know. I think that AI can also be like a very helpful tool. So I know for me, for example, we'll do like an hour long podcast and want to find like a one minute clip to post to promote that. And that's something that AI can be really helpful with, like adding in the subtitles without having to do that manually. So it's just uh, some aspects of AI can be a really great time saver and really helpful. So I see it as like a tool that's helping me do what I'm already doing and letting me spend more time like making cool decks and doing stuff that only I can do that AI can never do. So I think there can be some benefits uh, to it as well. Yeah, I use AI to help write scripts for the start of the podcast, you know, and, and it will create a description for YouTube for the podcast, which is a big pain in the butt. You don't want to have to, okay, I'm going to write like four paragraphs about this thing that I just talked about. You're like, I'm already editing. You're doing 20 other things. Having, having it as a tool to help you like work through your process is, is fine. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. I think it can be a good tool, but I hope it never replaces artists or content creators or anything like that, yeah. And with that, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, I want to, again, thank everyone for showing up. Thank you so much. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause. And, of course, I want to, again, thank my guests, Mark Rosewater and Saffron Olive. Thanks so much. I'm Zach Clark. Again, uh, this has been a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, have a great day. Have a great Magic Con. Hey everybody, I just wanted to mention our sponsors real quick, Moxfield.com and Tales of Adventure. Y'all know Moxfield. Moxfield is responsible for the best deck building website in the world, and you can get all your cards in one package all together at Tales of Adventure.